Welcome back, this is Tech for 10, following with the review of the 2019 MSI GS75 with the RTX 2070 Max-Q. Supporting in the Intel 6-core i7-8750H processor is the same processor as the 2018 GS65 I recently reviewed. Now, according to the initial reviews of the i7-9750H, which has just recently been released, I still go to the 8750H from 2018 uh, for price to performance. The real difference is the RTX 2070 Max-Q and the ray tracing technology. That's where you're paying for the money. With its 8GB of faster GDDR6 RAM, it should give you a very slight improvement in games compared to the 1070 Max-Q with the GDDR5 RAM. Having both the 2018 GS65 and now the 2019 GS75, I plan on comparing these two heavily and check for two things particularly. First. Has MSI improved the build quality compared to 2018 MSI GS65? Second, with the only change being the GPU, how much of a gain in games can we expect with the 2070 Max-Q to give us compared to the 2070 Max-Q? Now let's have a closer look and see what we can get. Starting off the design, weighing in at about 5.02 pounds or 2.28 kilograms, it is much lighter than an overpowered 17 Plus laptop I recently reviewed which was at 5.6 pounds. And while holding both laptops, you can really tell where you're paying the money is how compact and thin the GS75 is for a 17-inch laptop. The dimensions are about 396 millimeters long, 259 millimeters wide, and 90 millimeters thick. Now, while it may have a similar footprint to the OVP17, the slimness is something I just can't ignore and it is what really makes it very impressive. Looking around the laptops, you will find the simple but classy look that we have come to see from the GS65 lineup from last year with its all-metal chassis, aside from the bottom case, and with the copper colored accents and hinges. Now comparing the GS75 to last year's GS65, we can see that it made some improvements in build quality, but most of the change we can see around the speaker grill above the keyboard, which shows no flex now, which is great. My complaints here particularly start with the power supply. First off, this thing is large and heavy. And this power supply is only pushing 230 watts. So why is the gauge wire of the power supply the same size as my 1200 watt EVGA PC power supply? The great weight savings of this laptop is reduced somewhat by its unnecessarily thick and large power supply. Also, I'm not happy with how the power connector just haphazardly plugs into the laptop which has me concerned it will fall out at any moment having your laptop that's not charged. Overall, again, devilish good looks, slightly improved build. It is a notch above the average construction of last year's GS65 with room to improve particularly when it comes to the power supply and particularly also when it comes to uh, other aspects of a laptop. Like for example, who's gonna use a micro SD card? Like, seriously, you couldn't have just given us a full-size SD card reader? Going right into the laptop, you can see, like usual, there's a webcam at the top of the display with a 720p resolution. Nothing to write home about, like usual. Looking down, we are greeted by a very bright and vibrant display. At 17.3 inches, 1080p, 144Hz, and a max brightness of 360 nits, it is very pleasing to the eye. It has an sRGB rating of 161%, slightly better than the GS65 that was at 150, 150%, and much better than the overpowered 17 Plus which was 120 sRGB rating. But it still falls behind the Gigabyte Aero 15 X9 with 187% sRGB. Now in favor of battery life, MSI opted to use NVIDIA Optimus versus G-Sync, which in my opinion, this form factor 17 inches should have been reconsidered. Personally, 15 inches is where I believe the sweet spot is for mobile computing, gaming, and video editing on the go. However, there will always be that 1% of users who will look around a 10 pound laptop just for maximum performance. But this laptop would have really benefited from having a G-Sync display, especially with you having a lugging a huge power supply to begin with anyway. Now, with the increase in brightness and the color actually bundled with the 17.3 inch 144 hertz screen, it's truly a great experience, but lack of G-Sync is a missed opportunity, which could have set it apart for entirely from its competition. 
as we go further down to the laptop with this larger Steel Series keyboard, it would have been the perfect typing experience, except for the fact that the touchpad was so large, which is a good thing. However, my small baby hands rested on the palm rest, it would occasionally make the laptop scroll or click. This laptop could benefit from better palm ejection, or just incorporate a hardware switch like the overpowered line of laptops that can disable the trackpad and opt for a wireless mouse instead like most users on the go. Also, the Windows key is no longer on the left side of the keyboard, a little pet peeve of mine. You will find it relocated that it's on the right side of the keyboard. Which is unfortunate since I'm right handed, I'm usually using the trackpad with the right hand. And now I gotta move my hand from the trackpad up to hit the Windows button. Now, the good news is that when using the trackpad, like the GS65, provided flawless tracking with the Windows persistent drivers and with its gestures, worked perfectly the first time. And like we saw, the GS65 hidden the function here will light up all the keys that were utilized and uh, it's a handy feature, especially the 2019 Razor Blade now incorporates this feature where you hit the function button and all the buttons that actually can be used with the function key will light up. Going right into the sound profile, like the GS65, these speakers are loud. With a pair of 2 watt speakers, this produces enough sound to fill a room with crisp vocals, highs, and mids. However, like usual in a slim chassis, you're going to get lackluster bass. For most gaming enthusiasts, however, it's not an issue considering a pair of headsets will go a long way, especially for on-the-go gamers. And this is the case for this laptop. Honestly, marketing as a gaming laptop, I don't mind the laptop having tinny sounding speakers as long as it has a relatively good onboard sound card for plugging headsets, which GS75 and the GS65 delivers. Looking at the ports, you can find them both on the left and right side of the GX75. Starting with the left side, it has the power, the ethernet jack, a USB 3.1 port, a micro SD card slots, and separate headphone and mic lines. On the right side is a USB 3.1 Type-C port, two USB 3.1 ports, a Thunderbolt 3 port, and a full HDMI connector. The fact that they are able to include an Ethernet port, two USB Type-C's with one being Thunderbolt 3, a micro SD card reader, makes this check all the boxes making its I.O. much better than GS65, and closest to the perfect I.O. I've seen at chassis this slip. Going right into the performance, starting off with the hard drive, you have a 512GB M.2 NVMe. It provides speedy storage, but again here MSI is partitioned into two separate hard drives. Now, going further as a disclaimer, my model was the best my model. What this means for you is that the SKU particularly, they decided to put in a single 16GB RAM stick versus the ideal dual channel pair of 8GB sticks of RAM. Now, I plan on changing that as it's common knowledge now that dual channel RAM really does make a difference when it comes to gaming, and thus my testing reflects the modifications I made. Now, running the laptop through the battery test, you'll see on the screen the performance you can expect out of this laptop with a single channel 16GB RAM and dual channel RAM in the Cinebench and 3D Mark tests. Continuing on, the i7-8750H, as we've seen in previous laptops I've tested, gets hot. And this is no different, because while the box with the 8 is 64, I found the core clocks is set around 3.3 to 3.4 GHz, which is not bad, considering the HP Omen 15 with the 1070 Max Q settled around 2.9 GHz with the same test. So I will be providing another column to show the best optimized setup, including undervolt, thermal repaste, and dual channel RAM, without overclocking. On the screen, you'll see the frame rates I achieved under single channel and dual channel plus the undervolt and repaste. Now, as you can see, the performance is increased quite a bit with the dual channel and the undervolt using throttle stop, which allowed for 3.7 to 3.9 gigahertz as a settled core clock. Going into heat and thermal design, while testing with the 8064 out of the box, it would thermal throttle bringing core clocks down to 3.3 GHz under load, which is not bad considering how hot the CPU does get and how other chassis have done with this uh, CPU. Now with a simple undervolt, it does bring the performance back to 3.7 to 3.9 GHz of speed. The CPU temps, however, did peak at around 96 before quickly down clocking and settling at 85 to 88 degrees Celsius at that 3.3 to 3.4 GHz under load. 
Now with the undervolt settings, my max temperatures in Cinebench never went over 77 degrees, which is much nicer than the 96 degrees Celsius I just got. And Cinebench score didn't change, however temperatures, as I expect from undervolting, got a lot better. Now as expected out of the box, the GS75 with its larger chassis did provide slightly better thermals than the 15 inch GS65, but that is expected with the larger chassis. Going to the noise and how loud this thing gets, during light loads like watching YouTube, the fans are barely audible, and like the GS65, they usually stay below 30 decibels of sound with temperatures that are very nice, not 39 to 44 degrees Celsius, out of the box. Now under load with the fans on max, the volume does get at a max of 42 decibels, again better than the GS65 with temperature identical to the GS65 under sustained load at about 85 to 88 degrees Celsius. Now, doing the thermal undervolt as well as thermal repaste, I did find my uh, idle temperatures to get down to about 31 to 33 degrees Celsius, which is much better than the 39 to 44 degrees Celsius. With this 82 watt hour battery, it has good battery performance, with averaging about six to seven hours with word processing and local video play playback. Now while surfing the web, you can expect four to five hours with heavy gaming and video rendering about two to two and a half hours. Now like the GS65, the light indicator that is, tells you which graphic chip is being used is still present right next to the power button. And again, like I said before, I still love this feature and will continue to push that this feature should be incorporated in more laptops. As for upgradability, first let's start with the bad. The laptop still has a flip motherboard, however, there is a plus. This time, the massive amounts of storage, aka 3M.2 slots, are easily accessible with just removing the bottom panel, and there's no need to flip the motherboard. The only thing that you would need to flip the motherboard for is to upgrade the RAM, which you're going to want to do since it's only a single channel of 16GB of RAM. Now, the fact that there's two M.2 slots with two of them being NVMe makes this a great laptop for RAID NVMe drives, which I have installed on my laptop, rocking now two 2 terabyte Intel uh, M.2 NVMe drives in RAID 0 configuration with a 512 WD Blue SATA M.2 drive as my boot drive. In summary, the pros, excellent display with great brightness at 360 nits, the brightest display I've reviewed on my channel so far, above average battery life at 5-7 to seven hours, beating the 4 hours of average battery life of a gaming laptop, great port selection with a micro SD card slot, decent build quality and nice notch above the GS65 of last year, lightweight, and it's also very quiet at under 45 decibels technically around 42 decibels with max fan on. Now the cons, again, flip motherboard. There's a slight thermal throttling which can be fixed with uh, uh, undervolt. Lack of G-Sync, which it's a little nitpick of mine. Huge power supply with a bad plug. Poor palm rejection and unacceptable single channel RAM out the box. Now in terms of everything I review, this is a nearly perfect 17 inch gaming laptop with some aspects including this power supply, uh, trading the micro SD card for a full SD card reader, and even the lack of G-Sync being nitpicks that personally I would have looked to do better, but it is livable without any change. The only notable change I would be is to stop offering this in a single cha channel RAM configuration, offering a dual channel RAM only. Now, selling on a used mark for anywhere between $1,600 to $2,100, you can find this same laptop. Personally, my laptop was about $1,600, but adding dual channel 32GB RAM tacked on about $150. So in total, $1,750. It is a decent price for when a 15-inch laptop just isn't enough. And that's pretty much it for this video. Uh, links for this model is listed below from Best Buy. Now, if you could, please like and subscribe for more content. If you have any questions particularly, let me know. Please comment below. This is Tech for 10, signing off till next time. I can never...